Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Let's have a Bible class. What a thing to do on a Sunday afternoon, right? Okay. Um, uh, you can see I got lots more books spread out today. So this is going to be a really long Bible class. I don't know, four, maybe six hours. Obviously, I'm kidding, okay? Just kidding. Just kidding. I promise. So we're going to go back to Ephesians 5 and pick up on a couple of things to sort of complete this thought. Now, we've been, we've been dealing with things in chapter 5 on the basis of the fellowship of the mystery. It's why we're taught here in 4, 5, and 6. Primarily, it's why we're taught the things that we're taught about being in fellowship and getting along and, and working with one another and so on and so forth. Because it's the fellowship of the mystery, and it, it, there's a certain connotation to that that says most people don't understand this. That's the way it is. Most people do not understand this. You see, it... You have to think in terms of, why did the Lord write the Bible in the manner in which he did? For instance, I mean, it's very obvious how, how come he wrote Genesis to, um, what shall I say here, Genesis to Deuteronomy. That's very obvious how he had to do that, because that's the first manners, one, two, and three, in which he dealt with mankind. And so when you get to Deuteronomy, and the land comes in, the land equal <laughs> people not just the lord's people people in general and all of a sudden then from um joshua i wanted to say judges there because i really would prefer to use ju judges as the next thought in mind but from joshua to malachi well it has to be that way because that's the way things were that's the way things were but then he brought into the world the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected, and things changed. Now, everything didn't change. A little thing changed. Then another big change came, and on and on. And probably next week we're going to start in this, how the changes came after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because out here somewhere is us. And I'm going to do this like this. I'm going to do an arc right here. Because from somewhere in the book of Acts to somewhere in our future, because of the things written in Romans to Philemon, we are like an arc. We're like an over shadowing an overcasting or an overshadowing because if you take all of this back here and Matthew Mark Luke and John and then you come over here and you start in Hebrews and go all the way um, to Revelation you're back finishing this the finish of this is this over here and there is an overreaching arch. It is a parenthesis and it's a bracket. It's all those things. I'm not kidding. So, we who are in here, Romans to Philemon, we now live in the time frame of the fellowship of the mystery. We can't just go back and say, I'm going to be like Jesus. You don't know anybody who's ever become like Jesus, and you don't know anybody who's ever really good and tried. Think about it. If you were to try to be like Jesus, you wouldn't have anything. You couldn't gather anything. You wouldn't even get new clothing. You wouldn't wear out your shoes. And you'd walk everywhere you went. And you'd be gathered up by a few people who loved you, and a whole gob of people who hated you, and on and on it goes. Folks, you don't know anybody who's done that. Be like Jesus? I don't think so. We don't know anyone who's being like Jesus. So we can't just simply go back and say, well, I'm going to be like Jesus, and then I'm going to be all right. No, you're not, because number one, you're going to be Jewish. Jesus said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What are you going to do with that? 
You're going to go to the house. How many of you go into a town right now to, to speak up to other people about the Lord and you hunt up the Jews? See, even Paul for 25 to 30 years said to the Jew first, to the Jew first. And then he stopped saying that because it changed. And my point about all that is, and I don't know why this just happened. I apologize for that. Oh, I got it. There we go. Sorry about that. We, we, uh, we, we got a good picture of uh, Charles Lavelle there. Now, all of you people who are watching on Zoom or on YouTube, we're not going to charge you extra for getting, getting the picture of Charles and Lavelle. They were just being kind and, and lovable and in and themselves, and they didn't even know that they were on the video. If they had it, they'd have got up and danced. Sorry about that. I didn't know it was going to do that, but thank you for coming, Gloria. Glad to have you. Uh, now, here's the thing, folks. We are in this spot right here where we must show people the fellowship of the mystery. And the fellowship of the mystery is basically about this. Though the Lord showed all mankind what righteousness was, personified by Jesus Christ, and gave them a great, two great and gracious promises back there, in the, in the part over here that covers Genesis to Malachi and the part here that covers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he gave those people to whom he showed righteousness, he gave them gifts for the future. So I've got the black mark here with Hebrews and the red mark with Jesus Christ here in Revelation. So those promises are coming to fruition over there. Here we are, though, here, starting somewhere in act in the book of acts and going until we get taken out here we don't get those promises we don't get a promise about the land we don't get a promise about the great city we get very much a promise about being with the lord and you see what he did was he gave us something that made us to understand we need the fellowship of the mystery so we teach it as Paul delivered it, we teach it as the revelation of the mystery. And before we start in our subject matter, let me remind you of a couple of things. First of all, go back to Romans chapter 16. And we'll look at just a couple of things there and then get back to Ephesians 5, I promise, just a moment. Romans chapter 16, when he ends up this book, he says these words in verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, comes in verse 26. Now, with that in mind, we have this revelation of the mystery. Well, if you look it up, in all of Paul's epistles, it will show up to be eight mysteries. Now, some people say there's eight parts to the mystery. Okay, I'm not worried about that, but it's used mystery of, mystery of, mystery of, of eight different times. Now, here's the thing. When you're into Ephesians, go back to Ephesians down, look at Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now look at verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we've obtained an inheritance. Now, the, the obtaining of the inheritance is the key. Is it the land to, that God promised to someone forever? Is it the city where God said certain people were going to abide with him in that city? No, it's further away than that. Look in chapter 1, Ephesians 1. The power of God is what's in question here. He mentions God's, his mighty power in verse 19, and then he goes into verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now watch, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You see, here's the thing, folks. We who do not get the land, 
we who do not get that city, we get a position far above all heavens, and we are the fullness of him which filleth all in all. You could not find a more spiritual uh, terminology for yourself. You can't. That's the epitome of spiritualness. Now I want, you to, want to talk to you about the spiritualness of today's lesson. Go back to Ephesians 5 now. He says in Ephesians 5, we'll pick up in verse 16. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You see, right, right here at this point, it's almost like Paul says, as much as I've shown you, you should be understanding what the will of the Lord is. I mean, this, this is the last book written to a group of people. He wrote Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, Thessalonians, all of those books, nine all together right there, he wrote them to groups of people, to the church at, church at, church at. Then he wrote Ephesians. And this is like a capstone of the doctrine for the churches. So he says here that churches, we, should be redeeming the time and that we should be in full understanding of what the will of the Lord is. Now, folks, I, I don't know if you feel that or not. I don't know if you know what the will of the Lord is. I bet you know some of it, or you wouldn't be on this Bible class. You know, one of the things that is drawn from Timothy and spread out through the whole wide church, because Timothy is a type of us, is 2 Timothy 2.15, which we hang our hat on all the time. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So let's take rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, none of us is going to take a razor knife or a chopping block uh, uh, and make divisions in the Bible. So we're all going to do this in a manner of speaking inside, in between these two, these two floppy things on the side of our head. We're going to go right in there. Uh, golfers call it the most critical distance in golf is between the five and six inches that's right between there. Boy, they're right too. You see, we have that. We have the mind. Hmm. Interesting thing. Notice the next verse. He says in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now let's take for a moment what filled with the Spirit means. Filled with the Spirit is not a, a um, physical adaptation of something that's going on in your physical body. To be filled with the Spirit is to know the mind of the Spirit, is to understand the mind of the Spirit, is to see the way the Spirit sees things. Now, if you obeyed everything that was according to the being filled with the Spirit, you'd be noticeable. You know why? Nobody does. To be filled with the Spirit is to be able to understand the, the mind of the Spirit of God in a factor, whatever's going on, whether it's something going on around you, whether it's something you hear about, or whatever. How would you make application of God Almighty's Word, the way the Holy Spirit does, if you're not filled with the Spirit? So he says to the church, the body of Christ, he doesn't say, get this gift, be zapped with the Spirit. No, he says, be Filled with the Spirit. That means you work on it. The, the, the proper uh, subject word there that is the subject of that sentence is you be filled with the Spirit. And you can be. If you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that what? Needeth not to be ashamed. Doing, every, doing something in the name of the Lord does not make you Spirit-filled. Doing something in exact accordance with the Word of God that shows your spirit filled. Now it's got thousands of applications, and I know every one of us, even those whom would would be a, approaching the idea of being filled with the Spirit, 
not naming any names, you understand. But people who approach the idea of being filled with the Spirit make mistakes. Because we've got this human flesh. And sometimes it isn't the Spirit that drives us. It's that soul, that seat of emotions. Pitiful thing, seat of emotions. Now, the very next verse, however, gives us a clue. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Verse 19. Those he is in, imploring here to be filled with the Spirit, he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual things, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Spiritual things? Speaking to yourselves in psalms. Well, we know where that's at. It's back here in the Bible. And hymns. we got a whole book full of those. And then he says, and spiritual songs huh singing and making melody in your heart to the lord spiritual songs well now we need we need a definition and that's why i got all these books spread out here that these books are filled with definitions i want us to identify what is spiritual if we possibly can okay just what is spiritual now notice a companion verse like this Go over to Colossians chapter 3. And this is, when I say companion verse, I believe that Ephesians and Colossians are companion books. In other words, they're written to the same kind of people, people Paul did not know personally. And so it was all about the spiritual side of life with these two, these two books. And that wasn't true about the Philippians. It certainly wasn't true about the Corinthians and Thessalonians. We'll see some of that in a little bit. Look now, if you will, in uh, uh, verse uh, Four, uh, 15. Well, let's pick up in 14 because it's right after we get the picture of understanding that Christ forgave you, so therefore you forgive your brother. Okay, verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And by the way, that's about another hour Bible class right there on charity. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are, you are called in one body, and be you thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's that word spiritual again. Well, you know, I got to look it up. I had to look up the word spiritual. And by the Greek word, and I forget what the Greek word is, it's got something to do with P-N-E-U-M-O. But anyway... It says, of the word spiritual, it says pertaining to the spirit of man. But then it says that part of man that is akin to God, yet not higher, uh, higher than being simply a man, but not high, as high as God, but far less than God. It also means it is a part of your rational soul. Here's your soul filled with all the emotion, and you come into a spiritual need situation. You have to get the simple emotion out of your mind and heart, even though you may be very emotional about what's going on. But you have to, to make the right decision, you have to use the spiritual side and this, and the, of things. And it's called, in the, in the understanding of the word, it's talking about the rational part of your soul. Good thought, good, pur good purpose there. Now, the last thing that is in the definition list, and you can find this, you know, this is not strange, is one who is being governed. And the reason I didn't use the other part of that is because it says led. We can be governed by the Spirit of God and, and therefore be a spiritual person. And yet, we can fall by the wayside at being led by the Spirit of God. But if the governing body, the governing action, the governing fact of our decision-making is governed by, if we are led and pressed by whatever the Spirit of God is saying to us from this book, then we are Spirit-filled. And we're spiritual. Now let's look at what the Bible, who the Bible calls spiritual. And by the way, who it doesn't. Notice, if you will, in Romans chapter 1. We'll, we'll go from left to right in Paul's epistles as best we can here. 
and we'll get a picture on this. Romans chapter 1. We'll start in verse 9. Romans 1 verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means, uh, any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now watch carefully. He said, he's put, he's, he says, God is my witness. And he said, it's by the will of God that I'm expecting to do this. Now notice he says in verse 11, for I long to see you. That's an emotion. His soul would have been longing. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. To be established is to be put down solid rock-like. To be, to be started and put into place. Established. And he says it takes a spiritual gift for that to occur. He said, I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Well, imagine that spiritual gift being coming from Paul, who was governed by the Spirit of God, and all that he said and wrote. And he and he also is obviously got a rational soul when it comes to these people and their, their need for salvation and so forth. He says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's going to preach it at verse 15, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. I'm not ashamed of it. So he goes on in that manner. Look, if you, if you will, in Romans chapter 7. And people get upset sometimes when we make application of this, but you must make application of the things that Paul told you you should make application of. For instance, he said in, uh, in uh, verse 7, well, I can't read there. The subject matters are so tied together, you see. Anyway, um, verse 5, <clears throat> Romans 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh... When we were in the flesh, you go back and read 5, 6, 7, and 8, and you'll understand that. The motions of sins which were by the law. What do you mean the sins were by the law? Well, he explains that. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment. Deceived me and by it slew me. What was my problem with the law? Same as Paul's. I couldn't do it. And when it said, don't do it, I wanted to do it. So well, what's that going to do with spiritual? Well, look at this. Verse um, 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the, com the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know, watch now, when he says we know, you should take it down, right down, right there. We know. So I'm going to know that too, because Paul's going to tell me. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. It's of the Spirit of God. It's connected to the Spirit of God. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Great opposite. Spiritual, carnal. Carnal, spiritual. Spiritual, carnal. You got it? They're opposite. They're opposite. The law is good and holy and just, and the law is spiritual. People say, well, we're not under the law. Don't make any difference. It's still spiritual. It's God's word, isn't it? Isn't it a picture of God's righteousness? Yes, it is. Then you have to let it be there. You can't say, well, I have to do away with that. No, you can't do away with the law. Who ever told you to do a thing like that? The law is not involved in your salvation, ladies and gentlemen. But the law of God, his righteousness, which appears in the law, definitely is a spiritual side of life that you are privileged to hold and to hold dear. That is all now. Keep with me. Look in Romans chapter 15. 
Now, I want you to think, before we read this verse, I want you to think back to Israel, and they had the land, and he said to them, he said, you walk with me and do as I tell you to do, and I will, uh, I will lift you up above all the nations of the earth. You'll never be the borrower, only the lender, and he says, I'll make your your fields to be fat, your barns to be full, and on and on and on, all those promises, all those great and precious promises. When we read and put into our mind, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. The very next two verses say, you want good to come your way, you do that. And he's talking about good. He's talking about grain and whatever. Everything that makes life good. So you see, here's the thing. In chapter 15, Yes, in chapter 15, he says in verse 25, to the Romans who were Gentiles. Now, they were Gentiles who had a knowledge of the law. That's why he talks so much about the law in five chapters. And so they had knowledge of the law because they were a part of a Jewish community there, or at least Jews who understood the uh, Mosaic law. They were a part of that. He said, you're called a Jew and rest us in the law, chapter 2. He's trying to make them understand they were not living according to the law, even though they thought they were. And so when he gets to this part. Now he's talking about the Jews who are back in Jerusalem. Watch, verse uh, uh, 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, uh, parts of Europe, actually, to make a certain contribution to the for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. Now, here's these Gentiles over there. And Paul's been over there teaching them about Jesus Christ, a man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, born of a, of a woman, um, made, under, made under the law, and became the sacrifice for the sin of all those Europeans over there. Now watch, he says, uh, verse 27, it has pleased them verily. The Macedonians and the Caians, they've given this gift for Paul to take back. He says, uh, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their, Jerusalem's, spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. See, there's again, spiritual, carnal, spiritual, carnal. But, in this particular instance, what he's trying to get these people to see is that spiritual things are the things that come from the people of God who had been holding in the oracles of God for a thousand years, 1,500 years, the word of God which showed righteousness. And Jesus Christ, who came and lived under sin, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised again. Now he lives forever. And Paul's out there telling them, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And that's the spiritual gift you've received. And it came directly to you from the words held righteous and sacred by the Jews. And he says, if the Gentiles have been partakers, have been made partakers of their spiritual things, they had them, they were spiritual. He said, well, you're talking about a bunch of people who didn't believe in Jesus. I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about what the people held. And he says they, have, they were spiritual things, and they were... They were in need of carnal things. Gather up your carnal things. I'll take them over here and say, thank you for the spiritual things. See what I mean? That's what that's about. Spiritual and carnal are great opposites. All right, now look, if you will, in 1 Corinthians. You go to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a, don't miss this. Don't miss it no matter what's coming on next on your television set. Or where you have to go. Now. If you have to hit a pause button and come back, don't miss this next part, folks. This is great. It's important. We're talking about spiritual things. Things pertaining to the spirit that's in you that is akin to God. Things that keep you in position correctly uh, like God, but not God. It keeps your mind placed upon the things which God would have you to think about. Chapter 2. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Well, then right away, if they're, if they're delivered unto us by God's spirit, then they are quickly becoming to me very spiritual in nature. And you keep reading. Um, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit, middle of verse 10, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? You got one. Everybody's got one. We're born with the spirit, which is ours, body, soul, and spirit. So we want our uh, spirit to become akin to God's spirit, right? Um, and even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Nobody Nobody in the world can know the things of God let, except the Spirit of God let him see it. By the way, did you notice I didn't say they had to be saved? I believe there's a lot of lost people that see things about the Spirit of God and see things of God, and they know they're not of man, but they know they're from God, and they and yet they haven't ever trusted Christ as their Savior. They can be smart as a whip about all this and go to hell on a bobsled, you understand, because they won't trust Christ as their Savior. People think today you're talking about some preacher gets up and preaches how bad some sin is, and so the people that are out there doing that one or one like it are saying, well, he's just always preaching about sin. Well, he probably shouldn't be preaching about sin. He should be preaching about trusting Christ as your Savior. Because God sees all the people he wants to see. God knows how people are. But he sees righteousness in his Son. He can't see righteousness in you unless you're trusting in the Son. Hmm. Spiritual things. Keep reading. Uh, verse 12. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things, now watch carefully, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Now watch, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual things, that's stuff. With spiritual, that's the one who is spiritual. John said that Jesus, Jesus, quoting Jesus, John wrote, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's right there in the context that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, verse 13, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now watch the contrast. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. To have spiritual discernment is to understand what the Spirit of God is saying to you. And that has nothing to do with accumulated knowledge, although it includes it. It has everything to do with your, the Spirit which you've received of God, back up there in verse uh, 11, or 12. Not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. That Spirit in you receives the things of God. If the Spirit of God is to be your teacher, you're going to have to have that Spirit of God that God gave unto you. And you're going to have to let that Spirit align itself with the Spirit of God in order for the Spirit of God to make you understand things. Next verse. Uh, keep reading verse 14, I'm sorry. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But... He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Hmm. How can a spiritual man become the judge of all things? Well, remember that verse we used earlier, study to show thyself approved unto God. The spirit which is of God that you have in you 
will be taught by the Holy Spirit of God, the third person in the Godhead, if you study by rightly dividing the word of truth. What's the next verse? 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You know where it is? It's right here in this book. This is the mind of Christ. Amen. This is, if he had wanted to say more, would he have said it? If the, if the Lord wanted more of his plan, his detail, his wisdom, his residence, if he wanted more of that known, would the Bible be bigger? Yep. Does it need to be any bigger? Nope. Are the things you don't know, Jerry? Cobbs. You know what I conclude from that? If the Lord had wanted me to know them, he'd have put them in here. Another conversation this morning about the fact that I, and this person was agreeing with me also, I have no picture in my mind of what heaven is going to be like. And as the older I get, the, the more glad I am that that's the way it is. I don't really want to go up there and say, well, I thought there was going to be. No, I don't want to have thought of anything. I want that to be as the Lord presents it to me and puts me in it wherever he wants to put me. And, and the presence of the Lord is enough. It's enough. You see that spiritual passage you just read right there? That is a picture of your spiritual life. That's the greatest expectation, expectation, uh, the explanation of how spiritual living is from verse 9 through verse 16 right there in that chapter. I kid you not, that is. Went over in Ephesians and Colossians, those two capstone books about the end of all the doctrine for the church groups are talking about singing spiritual songs. Hmm. Now, if you will look over in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, well, just, just read, I'm sorry, it wasn't quite done here. The, the thought pattern follows in chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. We're all over the place in that, in that categorization there, from carnal to spiritual. Saved people are all over this, this spectrum. If you just got saved last week and you never have been exposed to Bible study, you, not, you don't, don't look like somebody's going to just come along and zap you on top of the head and give you all spiritual knowledge. They're not going to do that. It's study, and it's going to mean you have to open this book up and listen to it uh, when people preach out of it and, and read it out loud or listen to it on recording. Today, you've got scads and scads of ways to get the Word of God into your heart and mind. Take advantage of that. The King James Bible is exactly right. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing missing from it. It's exactly what the Lord warns you to read and study and hear. And your faith is going to grow by what you hear. From the word of God. That's what, that's what makes faith grow. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. That's great, isn't it? Yes, super. Now look, in, if you will, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter. Um, oh, let's see. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 9. And by the way, what makes me slow right there is that this book that has all these spiritual references right there. It must be on about. Um, three point type <laughs> I can, I'm lucky to read that chapter 9 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and this is all about how a man should approach his work with the Lord it really is, it's about a man's approach to his work uh, with the Lord, for the Lord and so forth he says in verse uh, 7 Paul writes who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? In other words, does a soldier pay for everything himself? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say of these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Uh, doth God take care for oxen? You know, Paul repeats that passage when he's talking to Timothy about people who teach the Bible. Just thought I'd throw that in. Notice he says here, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and that he that 
thresheth in hope, should be partaker of his hope. If we, preachers, apostles, in Paul's case, apostles, but the men who were with him, he includes them in the passage. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall also reap your carnal things? Remember the carnal things he's trying to get the Romans or the, uh, the Achaeans and the Macedonians to give their carnal things to those to whom they got the spiritual gifts? Likewise, same thing's true here. He says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is, a great, is it a great thing if we shall reap uh, your carnal things? In other places, he said, you know, everybody else has got this power over you, but preachers don't. Think about it. When's the last time you walked up to a movie house and said, I'm going in to have to see the movie? No, you pay. Go up to a ballpark. I don't need a ticket. I'm just going in and watch the ball game. Right. Everybody's got that power over you, right? The preachers come into your town, have a Bible class, open the door, people take everybody in, never say a word about it. And by the way, if a preacher comes into your town and he teaches a Bible class and he asks you for an offering, don't go back. It isn't that he may, he may have deserved an offering. You may want to give him one. Go ahead and give it to him. But if the man's got the audacity to ask you for it without the work standing up by itself, get away from that guy. You don't need him. You really don't. Now, but it is spiritual. In other words, your carnal things become spiritual in the hands of one who's deserving of them. That's what the context is. Now, I didn't mean to get off on that, but recently I had a conversation on Facebook where some people didn't think it was right to pay a grace preacher. They know the grace message. I think it's wrong to give the grace preacher money. They cited two or three people who had a career. And therefore, they didn't need any money. Number one, that individual sitting there in front of a Bible teacher, be it you, 10,000 other people like you, you don't have the foggiest idea what the preacher needs. You know why? Because if he's a man worth his salt, he ain't going to tell you. He's going to tell the Lord. But if you're being fed by him, if you're being taught by him, let him that is taught communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things, the Bible says. And so I pointed out those four scriptures, actually it was five, that make up the idea that it's right to give to the one that's preaching to you. They didn't like what I put on, so they didn't talk to me anymore. One guy tried to respond. I asked him for some proof, uh, scriptural proof, of what he said, and so he didn't give me any. You know, I didn't have any. You know why? Because he's misunderstanding the passages, and he thinks he's high and spiritually and above it. And he didn't even notice how spiritual it was to do such a thing. I'm sorry I didn't point that out to him. I forgot it was there. Maybe that was the Lord keeping me from making a really big mistake. Who knows? Now notice, if you will, in... in uh, um, um, 1 Corinthians 14. And I know I'm leaving a lot of context out of this, but I want you to understand spiritual things, if I can possibly get that across, and the spiritual life. Notice in verse 37. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, Paul writes, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual... When he wrote 1 Corinthians, it was very probable that there were still prophets there because all of the word of God was not written. And so a prophet, if a man would think himself to be a prophet, then it says, or spiritual. Well, based upon chapter 2, verse 9 through 16, don't you think some of these people should have been thinking of themselves as spiritual? Same people. Yes, of course they were. He says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. It would be a spiritual thing to do for a man or a system or a group of people or whatever to understand that the things Paul wrote, they are the commandments of the Lord, folks. That's the commandments of the Lord. Now, getting out of that, look in Galatians chapter 6. 
We will skip on over a little bit and get to Galatians chapter 6. And we'll read verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, hmm. considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now you see, here's the thing. A spiritual man is going to know the pitfalls just like he's going to know how to rise above them. The spiritual man in the context can go to someone overtaken in a fault and, and humbly and meekly speak unto them and cause them to see the error of their ways. But if it's a man who is so haughtily thinking of himself as being really, really spiritual and this poor downtrodden uh, man overtaken in a fault why he's got it see so much better than he says Girl, put him right in his place no 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 we none of us want to be put in our place because we all know what we're worth and we know that it, we're, none of us are worth the gunpowder take to blow us into hell except that Christ died for us and since I quoted Brother Moore I'll quote him also with you ain't worth a tinker's damn. Also, I don't want what I deserve. Give me mercy. Thank you, Lord. I don't want my just deserves. Now that's, to understand those things is how to approach somebody with meekness. You're not putting yourself as being above them. But you're reminding them of the spiritual side of life, the spiritual things, the things that are spiritual. You which are spiritual, restore such a one uh, with meekness. Now, here's the thing. That spiritual person who needs help there, he is not alone in this world. Look in, in uh, Uh, let's look quickly back to Romans chapter 8. I missed one there that I should have done at the time, and, and now I see I need it. Romans chapter 8, he says in um, verse 6, I think. Yes. He says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, I want you to think in terms of spiritually minded when we look at these other things, furthering our, our look on. Look in Ephesians chapter 1 now. And remember that spiritually minded you're supposed to be spiritually minded it's supposed to be spiritually minded spiritual that is having become better than man is in general but not as good as god but you are governed by the leadership of the holy spirit of god spiritual spiritually minded that's the that's the key notice in verse three Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Spiritual, things which are pertaining to God, belong to us. Things that are leading us up to seeing the reality of the Spirit of God in our lives belong to us. Those are the spiritual gifts. Spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Everything you do of a spiritual nature here has something to do with what you have up there. How can you do that, you say? Well, you almost said that. Look at chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul's prayer for people like you and me, right here, you and me. Paul's prayer is this. He says, he, verse 16, he, ceased, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may uh, know what is the hope of his calling. And he goes on with all of that. I'm, I'm thinking about the spirit of something. If you're going to be a spiritual man, a spiritual person in this world, a spiritual walk, uh, walking worthy person in the church, the body of Christ, to be spiritual, to have the characteristics of the spirit of God in you, to have on the um, uh, part of the, of the man that you are, the person that you are, that part of you which is akin to God Almighty. Spiritual. 
spiritual. So you've got this spirit of wisdom, and it gets bigger than that. Look at, now look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. He's, he commends a man named Epaphras in verse 7 for teaching these people. Verse 8. Who also, Epaphras, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Capital S. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Your love in the Spirit. Verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So you had spiritual wisdom in, in Ephesians 1. You got spiritual understanding here in Colossians 1. Hmm. Those things are going to go hand in hand, aren't they? What's that get you? Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. Hmm. Bunch of stuff there, isn't there? Bunches of stuff. Now, look, if you will, in uh, Colossians chapter 3. We read this while ago, but I want to read it now at the, at the close. Look here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, do you see yourself risen with Christ? Christ died for our sins. I died with him. Was buried. I was put away with him. He went to hell. Took my sins there. Was raised again the third day. I was resurrected with him. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Dear friends, be sure you understand who you are in Christ. Now read this, Colossians chapter 3, as far as we're going to go in it. Read this with the idea that you do know that you're risen with Christ. And if you haven't, if you don't know that, if you can't see that in your own spiritual mind, then consider, when did you trust Christ as your Savior? And what made you think otherwise after you trusted Christ as your Savior? What was it that made you think maybe something's lacking? I'm not talking about in your knowledge, but in your salvation. Is there anything lacking in your salvation? Or are you complete in Christ as Colossians chapter 2 told you you were? Now look. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Let me see. According to Ephesians chapter 1, that's all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Yes! All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And according to chapter Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, that's where they're at, and, that's what, and they are yours. Verse 3. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Then he says, mortify therefore, and he goes through this motley, fleshly bunch, this carnality, and says, mortify it, which means you put it away from yourself. You put, you, mortify means to kill it. Notice down in verse um, uh, 10, mm, li uh, 9, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Long list of stuff, tough stuff there, isn't it? Put it on. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forget, uh, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, 
which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There we are again. So we found out about it. We went back and discovered what it was. We read scripture that tells us how to understand it. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What more could I say about the spiritual side of our lives? Only one thing. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says in verse 6, Paul to Timothy, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now the sentence without being compounded, structured is structured like this. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but God hath given unto us the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. You see, it isn't that we go around saying, boy, am I powerful, or we go around saying, I love you, or we go around saying, I'm the smartest guy in the world because I've got this sound mind from God. We don't say that. Because we haven't got those things in a physical or carnal way. We've got them in a spiritual way. It's called the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. Work on that. Yes, you do have to work on it. You don't automatically see it. It's not automatically coming or rolling out of you. But it is yours. The Bible tells you so. What you see in the Bible has got your name tag on it. You take it. I thank you for being here today. I hope it's been helpful in some way, shape, or form. And that uh, the Bible will always have its place top drawer in your life. Thanks. See you later.